As you remain standing with me this morning, I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Peter. We're going back to 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. We're going to begin at verse 13. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, back in the fall, we started a verse-by-verse study of 1 Peter. And we've just been working through it. We pause when we need to, and then we pick it right back up. Today, we're going to jump right back into it at verse number 13. We have chosen this letter Because we believe that there are truths that we need to hear in the day that we're living in. Because remember, this letter was written at a time when the church was either right on the verge or right in the early stages of severe persecution. Severe persecution. Nero has blamed the Christians for burning down Rome. And there is mounting hostility growing through the Roman Empire. And the church needs comfort, they need direction, they need instruction, they need to know how to respond to a government that has turned against them, to citizens that have turned against them. We need to know how are we to conduct ourselves as men and women of God. And Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sits down and does just that addresses these issues. And though we do not believe that we're anywhere near first century Roman tyranny, at the same time, I think all of us can see there is mounting hostility that is being leveled against Christians in particular, especially those of us who believe in the inspiration of Scripture and hold to it for all of our decisions and all of our choices in life. So we gain from this how we are to live. And it brings us to chapter 2, verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free. Never using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. But living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God honor the emperor powerful words and father may you be glorified in everything that we say in jesus name and everyone said amen and amen once again would you give the lord all the praise and all the glory in his house and then before you're seated turn to your neighbor and tell him that you love him in jesus mighty name You know, I thought that where it's been a few weeks since we've been in our study, it would be good for me to just take a very quick moment and remind you, not of everything that we've studied up to this point, that would be too much, but to at least remind you of the context of the text that we're going to be looking at today. That context was laid out clearly in verses 11 and 12. And verses 11 and 12 actually represent a significant shift in this letter because everything that Peter has been discussing up to this moment has been to instruct us theologically. He's introduced to us theological truths, but now at verse 11 and 12, there in chapter 2, he's pivoting a little bit, and for the rest of the letter, he is going to say, and this is what these theological truths look like in day-to-day living. That's why it is so important for each and every one of us to study the word of the Lord, to know theological truths because they are to impact the way that we live day by day. The relationships that we have, 
the way that we live and that we conduct ourselves. And so that's why we're committed to preaching the doctrines of Scripture so that they will transform the way that we live. And so verse 11 and 12 is setting the context for the rest of the letter. And here's what it says. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. I believe that there is some echo in my mic, and that needs to be taken out. Which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you, listen to this, as evildoers. I'm still getting that echo, and nobody can find the answer. And I know that everybody's like, is this God speaking? or <laughs> This is... Um, I, we'll just do our best. Um, as evildoers, and that is very important to understand because he doesn't say it's just a difference of opinion. He doesn't say that it, it's just we're going to have to agree to disagree. He says, no, they're actually going to accuse you of evil. He says, they're accusing you of being the ones that are promoting evil in the world. They're going to call you the bigots. They're going to call you the racists. They're going to call you the haters. They're going to call you the reason that there is evil in this world, but in spite of it, you're to keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So in this context, he is telling us that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. That at the moment we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, in all sincerity, we defected from the United States of America and we became citizens of the kingdom of God. Can I hear a better amen? What he says is, from that moment on, you became, first and foremost, citizens of the kingdom of God, living temporarily in and among the kingdoms of this world, which will one day become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he will rule and reign forever. So he said, I need you to make sure you always remember, keep it straight in your mind, you are first a citizen of the kingdom of Almighty God, just living temporarily in and among the kingdoms of this world. You may remember that in the high priestly prayer of Christ that is recorded in John chapter 17, Jesus said, Father, I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. He says, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. I'm not asking you, Father, to take them from the world because they need to be here to proclaim the praises of the God who has called them out of darkness to walk in the marvelous light. What I am asking is that you keep them from the evil intent of the wicked one who has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. Let them live their lives to glorify you. And so Peter says, as a child of God, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, living temporarily in and among the kingdoms of this world. And as such, as the children of the Lord, they are to abstain from the passions of the flesh that are ever present within us, warring for control in our souls, so that we will keep our conduct among the unbelievers honorable. Honorable there means beautiful, it means handsome. It means to be morally excellent, that we are to conduct ourselves morally excellent. And we are to do this so that when unbelievers speak against us, when they falsely accuse us, when they ridicule us, and when they misrepresent us, instead, seeing that honorable conduct and how it not only reveals the righteousness of Christ, but it actually exposes the evil in their heart and their behavior, that they are deeply convicted just by the way we conduct ourselves. They fall upon their knees, repent of their sin, give glory to God, and prepare themselves to meet Jesus when he comes again. That's what he is saying here. He's saying the moment that you called upon the name of Jesus Christ, you were bought with a price. 
You were purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And you are not your own. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's own special possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that as you conduct yourself, men and women will be convicted just by the conduct of your life. Fall upon their knees, cry out to God for mercy, and prepare to meet God one day. That's powerful. Make no mistake about it, Peter is making it clear that oftentimes our conduct goes further and has a greater influence in converting the lost to Christ than does our conversation. There are some of you, all you ever worry about is what you're going to say to the unbeliever. But you've never paid any attention to how you live before them. And the world will never hear anything you've got to say until your life lines up with what you're speaking. In the words of Top Gun, stop writing checks your body can't cash. Live a godly life. Live an honorable life. And why is it that our conduct speaks so loudly? Because the world operates by the passions of their flesh. The world makes all of their decisions, all of their choices based entirely upon what feels right, what seems right, what gratifies them, what satisfies them, what gives them joy, what gives them peace. It's all made in the flesh. But when we conduct ourselves intelligently, honorably, Morally beautiful, morally handsome, morally excellent. We set ourselves apart and we give God the glory. We actually put Him on display. That's why we're to conduct ourselves differently in Jesus' name. You know, I, I tell you this story only because I, I had never heard it before. And it came to my mind as I was preparing this. But I was 17 years old. I believe it was my junior year in high school. And we always did a Christmas presentation, and we always did a spring presentation. And I was in um, the chorus or the, the choral group, and I was in band as well. And when we sang, we had to wear suit and ties for the guys. And, and one day I, I had my suit and my tie on, and our band director came over to me in a private moment, and he said, I just want to tell you something, Kurt. He says, you carry a suit well. Now, I had never heard that before. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you can't appreciate it right now. But he said, there are some guys that they can put on a suit. And it doesn't matter how expensive the suit is, how immaculate the tie is, and how it goes with everything. They just don't carry the suit well. He says, they don't conduct themselves any differently. They, they walk sloppy. They, they eat terribly. He says, they don't carry. But he says, I've been watching you through the years, and you just know how to carry a suit well. I never forgot that. Let me just say, Paul said, put on Jesus Christ. He's like a garment. You put him on. We need to carry him well. We need to conduct ourselves like royalty because we are the children of the king. Our, our, our lifestyle, the way we speak, the way we treat our husband, the way we treat our wife, the way that we honor the Lord, the way that we take care of his house, the reverence with which we walk in, it should, it should reflect God so that men and women when they see us, are seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the context of the rest of this letter. And so from verse 13 in chapter 2 through the end of this letter, what he's going to do now is offer to us application. 
He's saying this is the context, this is what God has called you to, and this is what it's going to look like in day-to-day life. And before he does that, he is going to offer one word that best defines what holy conduct is. Because he's not going to leave that open to our own personal definition. Because he knows, you know, if I just leave it out there hanging, this is honorable conduct, then they're just going to define it their way. He says, no, 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 I'm going to define it in one word. Holy conduct is summed up in one word found right there in verse 13, be subject. Or be submitted or be submissive. Our conduct in the earth among those who have not received Christ as Lord and Savior, the conduct that in the eyes of God is noble, is excellent, is morally beautiful, is morally handsome, is morally excellent, is Christ-like, is submission. It's a life of service. A life that is emptied of all selfish motive. A life that is emptied of all selfish intention. A life that is emptied of all selfish reason and selfish purpose and is focused on first and foremost living for the glory and for the honor of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so that I am putting on display the very character of God and then living to be a blessing to my fellow man. To not make any of my choices, any of my decisions based upon what I think will best suit me. But to make all of my choices and all of my decisions in the way that honors the Lord and blesses my fellow man. I am to live a life of submission or a life of service. It's amazing. We as a holy nation are putting on display the principles of the kingdom of heaven. The greatest of these being love, which we could also define as a life of submission. Now the reason that that is so important is because Jesus said of the last days in Matthew 24 and verse 12 that lawlessness will increase. And as a result, the love of many will grow cold. Jesus said that the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more there is going to be an increase of lawlessness. And we are seeing the increase of lawlessness even now, where men and women are not only disregarding the laws of God, but the laws of nature, the laws of science, the laws of biology. Men and women are saying, no one, not even law, is going to tell me how to live my life. And who I am going to be, what I am going to identify, and the choices and the decisions that I make. It is lawlessness. It is an evil, satanic spirit. And he said it's going to increase so greatly that the love of many, and I don't have the time to really go into this, but that lo- word love there is specifically used by the Greeks in that day to define the love you find in the church. So it seems to me that he's indicating that it's going to creep even into the church and that the love that many professing Christians say they have for God and for one another is going to grow cold. So that even Christians say, no one is going to tell me how to live my life. It's interesting because Paul in 2 Thessalonians twice identified the coming Antichrist as the lawless one who will be revealed. And that the coming of the lawless one will be by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. So what Jesus is saying and what Paul is elaborating on is that the closer that we get to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there is going to be a dramatic increase of lawlessness in the land, and it will continue to increase until it becomes embodied in one man we call the Antichrist, the lawless one. And the reason that multitudes are going to embrace him is because he represents everything they want, lawless life. No one is going to tell me how to live my life. And that will be the spirit of the age, and it already is. 
So upon the authority of God's word, I can sit here today and I can tell you that everyone in this room is either under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of his presence being self-control, which is nothing more than love, or you are under the sway of the spirit of Antichrist, the fruit of his presence being lawlessness or rebellion which, by the way, Samuel the prophet said, is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. This is serious, folks. Like for those of you that just think, you know, well, I'm just kind of naturally rebellious. You might want to rethink that before you check out. Because in the eyes of God, that rebellion is like witchcraft. Because witchcraft is the pursuit of power without submission to God. And so when you are rebellious, when you are stubborn and you're set in your ways, no one's going to tell me how to live. At a heart's level, you're nothing more than a witch or a warlock. Because what you want is power. You don't want to be submitted to the Lord. Aren't you glad you came to church today? That spirit is already here, and it's only going to increase, and it's going to increase to the point where the love of many Christians is going to grow cold. And that's why the Bible says that some will depart from the faith and will actually be part of the great falling away. So the life of the believer is to be a life of submission. Our lives are to be marked by a humble submission, a willingness to serve the Lord, a willingness to serve others. But who are we to be submitted to? Peter says it right there in verse 13. To every human institution. And I just want to quickly say this. He's not saying that these are institutions created by man. What he is saying is that they're God-created, God-ordained institutions that involve humanity. That's all that he is saying. So this is an all-encompassing term. When he says to every human institution, he is just saying of any God-created institution where humanity is involved and especially where there are lines of authority. And as I said a moment ago, beginning here at verse number 13 and continuing through, some would say the end of chapter 4, I would say it really is the rest of the letter. Peter is going to identify several human institutions, ones that hit much closer to home. He is going to speak about submission in the workplace and in business, submission in marriage and at home. Even submission within the church and among brothers and sisters of Christ. And even a general submission that we are to have toward all men and all women. And today, we could include school. We could include university. We could include police and authority. And and all of these institutions where there um, is any legitimate structure of authority, And where there are relationships with one another. And here he reminds us that as disciples of Christ, we are to be submitted to those particularly in positions of authority. And here in verse 13, he is going to begin this discussion of submission with government. Saying in verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. Pause right there. I don't want to take the time, but I think this is so interesting. That word supreme in the original Greek language is used by Paul also in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 3, where Paul famously says that we are to consider the needs and interests of others greater than our own. Greater is supreme. I love the way you're shouting now. He says, as believers, you are actually to be more concerned about the needs of everyone else than you are your own. And that was an overarching statement that he made. He just says, I'm just going to throw this out, that in one sense, you're to treat everyone else on earth as your superior, and you are to serve them. 
Say amen or ouch. It's still the word of the Lord. I don't care what... It, like, isn't that the cool thing? It doesn't matter to God that you agree with him or not. That's what the Bible says. This is the way it is in my kingdom. And all that Peter did is now apply it to an individual situation. And he said, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So Peter says, from Emperor Nero to the regional governors, to the centurions, to the soldiers that are under them, to the religious leaders, you are to be submitted to anyone in a position of authority. We would say today, from the president, to the governor, to the mayor, to the local police, to anyone who has authority, we are to be submitted to them and to their laws that they have established, whether we agree with them or not. Provided obedience to them does not make me disobedient to God, I am to be submitted. And the fact that I don't agree is irrelevant to God. And why are we to be submitted to them? Because they are sent by God. You may not like it. President Biden was chosen by God. You don't like it. Remember, God gives us who we deserve. (laughs) President Trump was chosen by God. President Bush, President Obama, can't even remember all the presidents. I've got 56 years of presidents that I got to try to keep straight now. They were sent by God. Daniel said in Daniel chapter 2, verse number 21, he removes kings and he sets up kings. When Jesus stood before his governor, Pilate, he acknowledged the authority that Pilate had, but he was very quick to remind him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. You know, it's interesting, as you walk through this, you may, if you're a student of the Bible, you may say, you know, Peter sounds a lot like Paul, and there's a reason for that. Peter was very influenced by Paul's teaching. In fact, his second letter, he will actually talk about the writings of Paul and how some of his teachings are very hard to understand. But Peter was very, very influenced by Paul's teaching. In fact, this letter was written about two or three years after the letter that Paul wrote to Rome. And Paul wrote very extensively about this very issue. You may know it, Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist, they've been instituted by God. Wow. He says, look, there is no authority but God. But any other governing authority on earth has been instituted by God and exists because of his plan. Therefore, believers, therefore, Bethel, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. You're not resisting them. You're resisting God. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, be very afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, which I believe is Paul's nod to capital punishment. Just a thought. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And I just want to say that that last part is very important. He says the reason that we subject ourselves to governing authorities is not for fear of God's wrath, but out of conscience. In other words, remember, God doesn't want you to follow him out of force. 
He wants you to follow him out of love. Being conscious that your disobedience to governing authority, your rebellion against any governing authority, is actually rebellion against God. And not wanting to grieve his holy heart, you subject yourself to honor him. We are to obey those who are in positions of authority. Now, some of you are saying, well, well am I supposed to obey everything? In general, yes. Isn't it amazing? We as Especially American Christians are always looking for the loophole. But Peter doesn't give any loophole. And remember, he's talking about being submitted to Nero, who was going to treat Christians in ways we wouldn't even want to talk about from the pulpit. And he says, submit to him. And he says, the reason that you're to submit to him is because God set them up to, and he makes it clear what government is supposed to do. This is what God wants government to do. To establish laws that protect the citizens and provide for the common good of those that abide in that region so that they can flourish. And then to set up authorities to make sure that those laws are kept. That's all that government was supposed to do. Unfortunately, there's overreach today. God is not into big government. Less government is the way God always wanted. He says, all I want you to do is establish moral laws that protect the citizen and promote human flourishing and then enforce those laws. Isn't it interesting that we live in a country where they want to defund enforcement? It's not a political statement. That's a biblical statement. It's lawlessness. God says, no, the whole reason I instituted authority, and I know that there are people that abuse it. No one's denying that. But throwing it away is not the way to deal with it either. He says, I want government to establish laws that protect citizens and promote human flourishing and then enforce those laws. And you submit to them. You submit to them. But there are occasions when it is proper to defy men because what they're asking us to do or commanding us to do will put us in disobedience to God. It's not disagreement. Like I can dis- There's a lot of things I disagree with in my government, but it's not telling me I've got to disobey God. So I've got to be submissive, whether I agree with it or not. I don't like where all my tax money goes, but... I'm not held accountable for where my tax money goes. They are. They've got to answer to God, not me. I answer to God on my willingness to submit or not. There are times when I do have to resist them because what they're asking me to do puts me in disobedience to God. Exodus 1 uh, would be an example of that. The midwives would not follow the command that Pharaoh said to kill all of the male Hebrew babies. They said, no, we fear God. Daniel 3 would be another example where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image. Because they only worship God. Daniel 6 would be another example when Daniel would not stop praying because there was an edict that went out that said he was not to. He continued to pray because no one is going to tell me that I cannot seek the face of my living God. Uh, Acts chapter 4 would be another example where the disciples were told to no longer preach in the name of Jesus Christ. And they said, well, you're going to have to make a decision here because we can't help but preach or teach in the name of Jesus. And we're not disobeying you, really. You're the one disobeying God. I have to submit to God first. And what you're asking me to do would put me in disobedience to the Lord, so I'm not going to do it. But there was still submission there. And the submission was the willingness to accept all the consequences that came with their decision. Each one of them said, you know what? you got to do what you got to do. you got to throw us into the furnace, great. you got to throw us to the lions, great. you got to stone us to death, that's fine. You know, we'll accept that. They didn't protest. They didn't resist. They didn't fight. They submitted themselves, believing that God would make a way where there seemed to be no other way. We are to be in submission for the glory of the Lord God. And why do we do this? You're going to love verse 15, for this is the will of God. (laughs) 
Turn to your neighbor and tell them, this is the will of God. <laughs> this is the will of God. I don't have to pray if God wants me to pay my taxes. I don't. It's the will of God. I don't have to pray if God wants me to keep the speed limit. It's God's will. It doesn't matter whether I think 55 is too slow or not. I can't align myself with Sammy Hagar. Some of you will know. I can't drive 55. I, I can't obey the world. I don't have to pray over these things. I don't have to pray if I have to obey the laws of the land. It is the will of God that I be submitted. And therefore, if I do not do it, I am disobeying not New Jersey. I'm disobeying God. Because he gave them the authority to set the laws that they think are best to preserve and protect the citizens and to promote human flourishing. You know what all this is? And I'm, I'm taking my time here. Because you're going to sit in front of a football game for four hours and think nothing of it. You can listen to me for one. I know that probably sounds arrogant, but I, 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 I just think this is important. I really do. All that Peter is doing here is he is building upon one statement that Jesus introduced during his ministry. Jesus didn't have time to talk about everything. So he just gave bullet points and said, listen to the apostles because they're going to build on these things. And there was an occasion where the religious leaders came to Jesus and said, should we be paying taxes to Caesar? And you got to remember, they hated Rome. And they were looking for a Messiah to deliver them from the captivity of Rome and establish the kingdom of God there in Jerusalem. And so they were testing Jesus to see where he'd fall on this line. And they said, should we be paying taxes to Caesar? I mean, he's a ruthless thug, should we? And Jesus said, whose image is on that coin? Caesar's. Then render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Now, if he'd stopped there, they would have said, see, you are a Roman sympathizer. But he didn't. He says, oh, and render to God what belongs to God. And what does the Bible say after that? It says that they all marveled. It silenced them. Because he, he perfectly marries these two thoughts together. Because I don't know if you've ever given any thought. Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Render to God what belongs to God. Let me ask you a question. Not a trick question. One word. What belongs to God? Some of you are struggling. Maybe we need to go back to kindergarten. What belongs to God? Everything. You know, President Biden doesn't own anything. He doesn't have any power. Governor Murphy has no power, doesn't own anything. You don't own anything. You don't have any power. It all belongs to God and has been delegated from him. That's the point he was making. He's saying God owns it all unless he delegated some of it. And you are to render to them what belongs to them for the sake of of the one who owns it all anyway. Can I hear a better amen? He's saying, look, th these are just mere men. They don't have any power. They think that they are something, but they're nothing. The, what they have was given to them by God. And you as believers are to recognize that and render to them what belongs to them, recognizing that it all belongs to Almighty God. Jesus' name. That's how we're to live. And we're to live this way because in verse 15 it says that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. You've got to remember what they were being accused of. They were being falsely accused of cannibalism. They were being falsely accused of insurrection, of sexual perversion, of even atheism because they only believed in one God. 
But Peter says, you know what, rather than debating them and protesting and yelling out at them, why don't you just live a consistent, honorable, morally excellent life? And your consistent conduct will eventually silence their ignorant, rebellious statements. Because everyone will just say, are you kidding me? I've been watching them for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And all I see is godliness in them. We give our critics nowhere to go when we live honorable lives in Jesus' name. So, he says in verse 16, live as people who are free. Notice this. Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. I love the tension of that verse. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. It sounds, it sounds like it's antagonistic. He says, live as people who are free, which is living as servants of God. You're free to be a servant. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're free to be a servant. You're free to live as a servant. He is properly stating the life of the believer in the kingdom of God. We are free, and he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And I'm thankful that I am free indeed, and free indeed means that I'm free completely. I am free totally, absolutely. I have one king. I have one governor. I have one authority. His name is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I have one king. I don't answer to Joe Biden. I don't answer to Phil Murphy. I answer to Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I am free But then Peter says, but don't ever use your freedom to be a cover-up, to justify or to normalize rebellious, evil living. Freedom doesn't mean that you're free to just go and live your life any way you want to. And to even resist authority. Never use that. And that has crept into the church. It's called antinomianism. It is the idea that I am without law. And I hear it even in the church. Maybe not ours, but I hear it all the time. And that is, you know, no one's going to tell me how to live. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Which, by the way, I believe. We're not under the law. We are under grace. I just don't believe it the way you do. Because you think that that means you're free to live any way you want to. Which Jude spoke of in his letter and said they turned the grace of God into lewdness or into a license to sin. They think that because they're saved by grace and not by their works that they're free to live any way they want to. He says that's an abuse of the grace of God. We do live under a law. One law. One. Peter said love is the fulfillment of the law. I am to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I am to love my neighbor as I love myself. I am to love God supremely. I am to love my fellow man equally. I am to live my life in a way that honors the Lord and that is a blessing to my fellow man. I am free. But I am free to be a servant. And not to serve myself. I am free. No longer a slave to my cravings. To my appetites. I'm not an animal that can't say no. To every treat that dangles in front of me. I've been delivered from that. I'm free to live an honorable life. I'm free, and I should never use my freedom to live recklessly or rebelliously, but to live a life that honors God and blesses my fellow man. You tell me who the free man is. The one that goes out and breaks the law, or the man who lives compliant to the law. The man that gets into his car, and from the moment that he leaves to the moment he arrives, breaks every speeding limit, and just, you know, is angry and and testy with every person he shares a road with, or 
Is it the one that gets into the car, sets the cruise at the posted speed limit and just says, thank you, Jesus. I'll get there when I get there. Traffic jam, no big deal. God's in control of it all. My wife says, Pastor, I wish you would practice what you preach. That's why I picked that one, because that is not always my M.O. But I have to remember, you disobey, you're disobeying God. So, he concludes this with these words, honor everyone, honor there is respect. I'm to honor everyone, turn to your neighbor and tell him, honor everyone. Everyone, everyone, I looked everyone up in the Greek, and to my amazement, it means everyone. Everyone. You say, how do I honor a a despicable human being? Because there are many. I got to remember that every man and every woman is an image bearer. Imago Dei. They bear the image of their creator because every man and every woman is born or created in the image of God. And no matter how marred that image may be of sin, they still carry the image of God. And I can treat them with dignity and with respect even when they have not been dignified and deserve no respect. And my prayer is that treating them that way, they would fall upon their knees, give glory to God. Because nobody else will treat them that way. I'm to honor everyone. I'm to love the brotherhood. That is specifically the special love that exists in the body of Christ. We honor everyone in the world, but we love one another in the church. There's supposed to be an affectionate love in the body, you can't find anywhere else. That's what Jesus said. They'll know you're my disciples in how you love one another. Not the world. We honor them. We love one another. We fear God. We walk in reverent, worshipful awe of our Creator, not wanting to bring anything into His presence that would grieve His Holy Spirit. And we're to honor the emperor or the king. Isn't that interesting? Because he just said, honor everyone. Well, the emperor would be everyone. Why does he reiterate it? Because he's recognizing there are levels of authority. And I have to show greater honor to whom more honor was given. So you come to my house, I'm going to honor you. If you're a child of God, I'm going to love on you. But if I ever get a knock on my door one day and I open it up and the secret service is standing there, And they say, President Biden would love to come in and visit you for an hour. It doesn't matter if I agree with anything he says. I welcome him in. And I show him greater honor. Greater honor. Because God gave him greater honor. And I do that. Why? Because I want him to fall on his knees and call upon the name of Jesus Christ. That is how we are to live our lives in submission. And once again, verse 13 provides the motivation for the Lord's sake. Turn to your neighbor. Say, for the Lord's sake. I don't... I I am not going to cow down to even the President of the United States. But I am going to show him honor for the Lord's sake. Because God gave him some of his authority so that I would render to him what is due, doing it for the sake of the Lord. His name, God's name, is on the line. I have chosen to put on Christ Jesus And now I need to carry Christ well. I need to carry him respectfully. His name is on the line. Everything that we do as Christians has to reflect the character of God. That's what we've always said. That's what true worship is. 
I love our singing, but that's not true worship. True worship is how I live exactly. And I have to live in such a way that reflected in the attitude I have, in the words that I speak, everything is the character of God. So every time I get into my car, I've got to, I've got to ask myself, as I drive today, as I choose my rate of acceleration, as I choose my attitude, everything, as I drive today, will the character of God be reflected in my driving? Will people be able to watch how I drive? And will they see the love of God? Will they see the mercy of God? Will they see the forgiveness of God when they cut me off? Will I reflect in my driving today the righteousness of God, the justice of God, the holiness of God, the truthfulness of God, the faithfulness of God, the wisdom of God? Will men and women see in my driving today the character of Jesus Christ? Or will I have the character of Antichrist? And I've seen some of you drive. In how I pay my taxes. In how I treat my wife how I treat my son, my daughter-in-law, my daughter, my mom, my dad, you, people I agree with, people I disagree with. Am I reflecting the character of Christ? Or is it all about me? Is it that lawlessness? I'll close with this. James 3, verse number 9. I just finished reading this in my own devotions and it was amazing. It says, with it, our tongue. We bless our God and Father and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Now, I only bring that one up because all throughout the New Testament, you'll find these analogies that how we treat men and women on a, on a horizontal level says a lot about how we treat God vertically. And as I, I meditated on that, it's like God, it's not like it, it is. God has designated and delegated just enough of himself to everyone on this planet. If it is just that he created them in his image. But everyone has a little bit of God in them so that by our treatment of them, we would be able to measure our treatment to God. Think about it. How can I say that I submit to God if I can't submit to government? How can I say I praise the Lord, but I curse other humans and mock them? I said at the very beginning, I know this message is not going to cause anybody to jump up and down and swing and some of you, that's what you want. You want that high energy. And I do too. Listen, I want revival. That's why I'm preaching this way. Because I grew up in that environment where it was all thrill. But you know what? I was thinking about it. I've never heard a sermon in my life on that text. Because it doesn't get everybody excited. And it's the reason that we can't sustain an ongoing revival because people don't want to live right. I want to come to church and get all excited, but I don't want to have to repent of my rebellion and bring myself into submission. But that's what we desire in this hour. In Jesus' name.